Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is The Principle of Moments from Robert Plant. Robert Plant is an English singer and songwriter, best known for being the lead vocalist of Led Zeppelin from 1968 until they disbanded in 1980. I don't think you really need to know much more about him. <laughs> well, band club, what's Zeppelin? <laughs> the Principle of Moments is Plant's second su- solo studio album. It was released on July 11th, 1983 by Plant's uh, label Esperanza, as well as Atlantic Records, produced by Robert Plant, Benji Lefavo, apologies to any French speakers out there for that, and Pat Moran, and features Robert Plant on lead and background vocals, Robbie Blunt on guitar, um, Gerard Woodruff on synthesizers, Paul Martinez on bass, Phil Collins on drums on all but two tracks. And could you pick those two tracks out? Uh, I I was told before I tried to to pick them out, but oh, you so, you was... knew I had it. Which specific yeah. tracks? Oh, okay. Because I could hear a big difference. Yeah, when once you, you like listen through it mm. after hearing that, it's like, oh yeah, that's obvious. Mm-hmm. And uh, on on Barrymore Barlow from Jethro Tull on those. And it two was tracks. obvious, like one of the first track. It was obvious where he was from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> then the second one, not so much. And uh, with additional musicians, John <laughs> David and Ray Martinez on background vocals. Given that Ray Martinez has the same last name as the bass player, I'm guessing brother was just hanging around the studio. We brought in to do some background vocals. Anyway, reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but on our blog, John, at johnescotto.com, and the descri- in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. Now, on to the tracks, starting with track one, Other Arms. According to the book, What Did I Say? The Atlantic Story, Atlantic Records intended to release Other Arms as a single, but Plant refused, not wanting to be pigeonholed as a hard rock artist. Good for him, because... It... Instead, two slower tempo songs uh, from the album uh, were released, Big Log and In the Mood. Both became top 10 hits in the mainstream rock chart and top, to f- top 50 on, on the Billboard Hot 100. Despite not being released as a single, Other Arms became a number one hit on the mainstream rock chart. It reached the number one spot on August 13th, 83, ending the nine-week chart-topping run of Every Breath You Take by the Police. <laughs> I mean, Other Arms it is very much a, a Led Zeppelin. Yeah, you know. this is a typical rock song, which is why it leads off the album. Like, it's kind of a slicker, slower version of Song Remains the Same, I think, even. I can kind of see that. Um, I should point out that this is one of my Desert Island discs. I adore this album. Um, but this is, you know, it's, it's not one of my favorite songs. Um, I think the bass is a bit muddled, um, which is a shame because Paul Martinez is amazing on the rest of the album. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to give respect to Phil Collins. I, I have some issues with his commercial decisions over the years. <laughs> but... He does not get his due as a drummer. No, no, he does not. I mean, and before he became a singer, his drumming was just amazing, really. I mean, and he's not a very showy player, but he has yeah, this he, incredible yeah, his times. <laughs> I mean, you're much more familiar with Genesis, <laughs> early Genesis, well, Genesis in general than I am, but especially the early stuff. Um, but Collins has this great ability to sound to make very simple parts sound fucking epic. They kept having to tell him, you don't have to fit as many notes as possible. Okay, he was a show off early on. <laughs> you know, like the song Squonk, they they wanted to do it was, you know, because they heard, and I'm, I'm bringing this back to Zeppelin, so don't worry. Oh, no, I'm, I'm perfectly fine going to tangent. We're going to tangent they, this week. They heard Cashmere on an am radio like the first time ever, they ever heard it they're in i a totally car hear the similarity now they're, they're in a car together they hear cashmere I've never noticed it before and they weren't quite sure that it was zeppelin because you know they'd never heard it before they thought it might have even been a female lead singer and and banks is telling phil like listen to that see you don't have to fill as many notes in listen to what he's doing just mm-hmm. i mean he's putting so much tension in the song yeah and so 
if you're familiar with the song Squonk, he 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 does this fucking thing, same thing anyway. He just fills as many notes in there as possible. Yeah. Just like, ah, oh, whatever. Which is interesting because <laughs> Bonzo and Collins were opposites in a yeah. certain sense. I'm guessing Collins was pr- probably very Ringo influenced. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because they both <clears throat> sit about as far behind the beat as you can without actually missing it. Yeah. Which I love about Collins playing. He's way behind the beat. Um, quick explanation. Um, there's a a matter of split seconds between where the beat actually technically falls, where you can fit a, a, a ahead of it or behind it. Playing ahead of it adds tension. Playing behind of, behind it gives it a, a very relaxed kind of swing, almost shuffle feel. Uh, Collins and Ringo play very behind the beat. Bonzo played way ahead of the beat. Um, perfect example of an ahead, ahead of the beat drummer, Ian Pace from Deep Purple. He drove that band. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can hear that. Um, Collins always sat behind the beat. I, I prefer behind the beat drummers. Um Neil, weirdly, even though he's one of my favorites, way at, was pretty far ahead. Um, so I've loved Collins about that about Collins is his swing and his ability to make very simple parts sound amazing. We last week off air we're talking about in the air tonight. <laughs> that that fill that comes in in the middle is incredibly simple. Oh it's yeah, two double stick hits going down the toms, mostly evenly spaced until the end. He slows down at the end of to work into the groove but it's fucking epic and it's not just a graded reverb it's just beautifully tasty right and, and that's exactly what the song needs at that moment you couple that with the gated reverb and it's yeah. just like holy the gated shit reverb is just the icing on the cake but it's just it's the timing and it's just he's like and i guess this is ringo too but collins more so because collins played more fills than ringo ever did um collins is like keith richards on drums because Interesting. Keith Richards, you know, I forget this is a qu- who I'm quoting here, f- referring to themselves, but I would know, love I, to hear I, the two of them play together. Oh, I actually think about it. it. I mean, nothing wrong with Wyman, of course. Yeah. I love Wyman too. Well, um, no, uh, Watts was the drummer. Oh, Watts, right? Sorry, it's the drummer. They're still together. It's still the drummer. Um, Wyman was the bass player. Um, but um, I, I forget who said this, but I think it might even be the king. I don't play a lot of notes, just the right ones. <laughs> You know, Keith Richards doesn't play a lot of notes, just the right ones. And I've I've recently been noticing, and again, this is probably due to my switch to percussion. Um, Collins doesn't play a lot of notes, just the right ones. You know, his fills are just simple and just exactly what needs to be played in that moment. Um, back to other arms. One of the few songs with overdubbed guitars. I think there's like two of them. And I think ultimately it does end up getting a bit muddled. Right, and I could. I'm so glad that he did not put this out as a single mm-hmm. and just you know let it organically gain popularity. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of weird. It almost doesn't really belong. It doesn't fit with the rest of the it album. Doesn't. Really, um, the I do like the rhythmic background mood. vocals in verse two. They do a lot of you know interesting things with background vocals. Um, I think the other two guys, um, what were their names, John David and Ray Martinez. I think this is the only song they were on. I think. All of the other background vocals are probably plant. Um, The keyboards are nice and subtle. Um, Like I said, it leads off the album because it's a rock song. And then the other weird thing about it is it has a ridiculously long fade out. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Like, but why why would they have done that? They they didn't put their best foot forward because they wanted to sell a rock. You know, they still wanted to sell plant as a rock artist. True. But like the fade out is like a minute. Yeah, Yeah. And they're just, it's a jam session at that point. Yeah. And he's just doing his usual, you know, bluesy vamping. On to track two, In the Mood. This is, like I said, it's one of my favorite albums, one of my Desert Island Discs. So I went in before I even listened to it for this review and had my my favorite and my weakest picked. Throughout listening to it, I kind of thought I might change my favorite because I was very tempted by a couple other songs. To ultimately decide to keep it the same. My weakest never changed. It is this one. It's, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of 80s acts that took this. It's, I think it's mostly just the repetitive lyrics that I hate. Yeah, the lyrics are pretty bad. It's got a nice fade in. 
Um, I love the guitar tone. Um, you can finally hear the bass. But, like, Simple Minds. Th- th- yeah, they, yeah. They completely stole this. True, true. This is, like, what, three years before Alive and Kicking? Oh, shit, yeah. I never caught that. And I think ZZ Top, like, wow. when they did Rough Boy a couple years, a year I or two later. It's been later. too long since I've heard Rough Boy, but I do like Alive, I like Alive and Kicking a lot. And I've, I've listened to it recently, and oh, they did totally rip this off. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of. Wow. I mean, I'd heard this. I'd heard this song before. I mean, I think this is like this and and uh, Big Log are the only ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these were the that, singles, right? Uh, but this one, I, I'd heard you know many times. Mm-hmm. In fact, I thought this was the big single off the album until it got to Big Log. I'm like, oh, I remember this one too. Yeah. Um, it does have a nice groove. Love the bass tone. Martinez has this beautiful, crisp tone. Um, and Collins, again, he always sounds like him. He does. I mean, he pumps as much life into this thing. Yeah, Collins is playing his ass <laughs> off on this one. He is. Like, everything else is just so chill and mellow. But, uh, I mean, I guess Plant was like, you know, just, just fucking go off. Then. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this is the point where I really started to appreciate Collins. Because I I knew he was good, but I never really appreciated it. And, and again, I know this album like the back of my hand, but I never paid attention to the drums. Um, I, I kind of glossed over this last time. I kind of dropped that I've become a percussionist after 35 years <laughs> as a string player. Um, quick version, I bought myself some egg shakers. Um, short egg, small egg shake per, you know, rattles, basically. Yeah. Imagine maracas without the handles um, right. for Christmas. And just realized that I really liked playing them and little by little built up a small collection of percussion instruments. Um, and it's, of course, got me thinking more about drums and just realizing how signature Colin's playing is. You know, thinking about his playing on this and his playing on all of his solo albums that, you know, I'm incredibly sick of. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, I mean, his drumming skills, mm-hmm. impeccable, there's no question. It's, it. It was his songwriting skills that were annoying more than anything else. Um, (laughs) I've been hearing it a lot. Uh, It's been for for somebody recommended to me a lot on YouTube recently, Um, and I've developed an appreciation for "Take Me Home." Oh yeah, that's probably one of his best. It's a great song. That is uh, probably his best written song, and it's horribly produced. (laughs) It's produced as an '80s commercial pop song when it's. This really dark song that was written about Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, like, I think they all had their, um, like, him, Rutherford, and, and Peter Gabriel all did kind of, like, the same thing. Like, um, oh, just um, the story about the person needing to get getting out of the institution, oh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. It's, it's an appealing story, um, particularly if you deal with any mental health issues. Um, but... As a drummer, first off, as a songwriter, even if you look at a lot of his really commercial, disgustingly commercial songs, if you break them down, they're good songs. I, if I had, if I had to bet, though, I would not be shocked if it came out that Peter Gabriel did some co-writing with him on that. Take me home, probably, because <laughs> they they even say that's Gabriel. It does doing sound like a Gabriel of, song, yeah. That's doing the doing like the harmonies with him at the end, uh-huh. the take, take yeah, me home I can hear part. It. And it sounds like it does sound like a Gabriel song. Now that you mention it, but um, yeah, produced in the most bubblegum yeah, way yeah. possible. And that was his issue was the commerciality of his music because his songwriting, the right. studio aside, is solid. I if you take his first two solo albums, they're they're damn good. Yeah. There, there's no pretense to it. No jacket and was then, the second one, right? That no jacket's the third, and that's where oh, it's third. just like Jesus Christ. Okay, that's, that's where you get no studio. Had some great moments. So studio is horrible. Yeah, no, no argument there. But right. take me home is on Cecilia. or is on no jacket required. It is. Um, yeah. Um, one more night I've always loved. Mm. You know, it has its moments. Um, it's just the it always production. Me that he he ripped off Gabriel's lyrics from Supper's Ready of that the river to the sea oh, instead of like okay. the river to the ocean. Okay, I can see being bitter about that. But again, back to his drumming though. Yeah, he, like Star, like Ringo Star, 
he you, he just has to play a few notes and you know it's him. Yeah. Um, and I just love how far back from the beat he sits. Um, I want to like this song because a lot of it works for me. The guitar tone is beautiful. The, the bass tone is beautiful. It's got a great groove. Two amazing solos. It's just, if you take out Plant, I'd like it. <laughs> and and it's kind of it's kind of an absurd thing. He it's his album. And if you take him out, it's a good song. Why why doesn't he sing more on his album or have better <laughs> lyrics at least on this song anyway? Well, I don't really analyze Plant's lyrics much. I I'm a long time Zeppelin fan. I've realized yeah. that's not worth it. Um, but this particular song, it's just so repetitive and twee. Um, I love the little lick at the end of the guitar solo. And the keyboard and drum dual solo. Oh, yeah. Collins just goes off during the keyboard solo. It's awesome. (laughs) He's probably wanted to do that uh, to Banks for a good (laughs) solid decade, at least at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, Love the little orchestral keyboard on the fade out. And now it gets good. On to track three, Messing with the Mekon. The Mekon is a British comic book villain from the 50s, arch nemesis of hero Dan Dare. Plant was known for naming songs, giving songs titles that had nothing to do with the lyrics. <laughs> he did that a lot. Um, love how this one just jumps in. Um, the timing on that intro must have taken a lot of work. I was going to say, I don't know if it jumps in, because the first minute, it's kind of like, oh, is this going to be like another like really slow, mellow song? <laughs> True. And then and that, then that syncopated riff comes in. I love the timing on that. Must have taken forever. Um, love the call and response on the guitar and bass. You know, bass hits a note, guitar hits a chord, and they just kind of go back and forth in this rhythm. Love Colin's fill in the verse um, and the abrupt groove change when it gets to the chorus. Admittedly, the chorus does go very 80s. Oh, yes. Um great keyboard solo great again drums behind it i think he was taking out his frustration uh with both banks on this because he does tend to go off behind the keyboards um which i mean he's had at this point he's done two solo albums already yeah. he could do whatever he wants right, right, right. <laughs> um what i love about this album and how i've realized that you know I, I don't know if i heard this one in 83 but it wasn't long after it was before i started playing guitar in 85 um I love that everyone stands out on this album. You can hear every al- every instrument. And a lot of times I'll, I'll say a particular musician owns an album. Everyone owns this album. Yeah, Plant is very gracious to just let these guys, you know, pretty much run off with this. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bass solo on this. It kind It goes very prog at the end. Yeah, like they come back to the main first part, and mm-hmm. uh, only there's like a bass solo in it. Yeah, and it just goes kind of weird at the end. Um, I'll also point out that Robbie Blunt, the guitarist, is one of my biggest influences. Like, his playing on this album, I have been trying to impersonate for 35 years. Where else has he played? I was trying to figure well, that he's out. He's a studio guy. Um, he mostly studio. does blues these days. Done a lot of blues stuff since then, but yeah, he played on, he did the new wave thing on this and really did something that really no one else had done in terms of a guitar style. Um, more on that later as I get to specific songs. Uh, on to track four, Reckless Love. This is the one, the first one with uh, Barrymore Barlow. And it has a very different feel than Collins. I think it actually might be. Uh... My pick for strongest uh-huh. on this. Um, has a very Middle Eastern feel. And you. this is when you, you could tell. The guy from Tull played on this. Yes. You could definitely see, pick up like a Jethro Tull yeah. rock vibe from it, you know. Um, because, it, you know, this is the guy. I actually have to see which albums he played on. I know it wasn't Aqualung. They had a different drummer on been, Aqualung. He, he was like there. I think he was there like 71. Okay. Because I checked Aqualung. Um but like this is the guy who probably played on Fat Man, and and you know some some of those other kind of kind of world music songs, because he nails that Middle Eastern feel. 
Um, but the the real star of this song, of course, is that the bass. Oh I yeah, mean, love the shit. bass sound and how high it is in the mix. And yeah, Martinez just owns this one. Now, okay, so you're 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 familiar with this one from when it was released, though. Or a couple that, years that, is, that isn't like from just from the remaster, right? When they're putting those, like. No, I own. I had this on cassette. In at least eighty four notes in that that just kind of blast over it. No, those were all there. Oh, that's awesome. Those kind of, the, <laughs> yeah. Um, those sort of keyboard stabs in verse two, they've been there from they were on the cassette in the early eighties. That's great. <laughs> this this mix sounds no different than I've heard this song for thirty six years. That 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 is awesome. Um. But yeah, Barlow's playing is just much more complex than Collins. I mean, I've just been, you know, giving Collins his due, but yeah, yeah. Barlow can do things he Collins can't. <laughs> <laughs> Love the groove. Um, again, another one with overdubs, but it doesn't get muddled this time. Um, guitar overdubs, I meant to say. Love the big slide on the chorus. This big distorted slide guitar comes in. Um, <laughs> These random keyboard stabs that you mentioned. Um, love those. And it, it kind of jumps out for a solo at, at that point, the keyboard. Yeah. With this, it's an, almost an organ sound, but it's this like demented organ sound. And then again, there's just this jam session at the end that goes along. But it's really brilliant because they kind of trade solos. Yeah, it's it's definitely like the centerpiece of the album. I feel because like, it literally ends the first side. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the um, Woodruff, the keyboardist, and and Robbie Blunt just trade solos during the fade with with you know Plant just shouting his his cliche <laughs> bluesy things. <laughs> On to track five, through with the two step. This is the ballad. Right, you know, it took me a while to figure out that it was the ballad, which makes it good. <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not like, a cliche I'm really ballad. I'm not sure of this. What is this? <laughs> is it pop? Is it a prog throwback? It starts off with this wind sound effect before everybody was doing that. Bear in mind, again, 83, before it became a cliche. Um, I do hear a bit of Duran Duran in this. Yeah. And this is their era. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I do feel like they were borrowing, maybe borrowing a little bit. Um, but if you're going to borrow, borrowing from Nick Rhodes in 83 is not a bad idea. Right. Um, Love the opening keyboard sound and this little short bass solo or lead work, lead part. Um, I mean, I've been going out about the bass tone, but it's especially good on this one. And it's a great vocal melody. Um, Plant really does his best to avoid his cliches. Yeah, I don't know. And if just it's sing really, earnestly. I don't know if it's a good fit for his voice, though. You know, I appreciate that he tried. Okay. You know, he's known for the bluesy stuff. He just did a straight, earnest ballad, and I like that. Love the guitar solo. Yeah, I kept expecting this to go more rockabilly because he did that. I, I even forgot he he called it a different band name. The Honey Drippers. Yeah. <laughs> I had to like look up like when because I'm looking at his catalog, his discography. I'm like, when, when was that stuff when he did that all was that? Crap? Just after Zeppelin, and it was like right after. It was like two years after this. Oh, it was two hours. I was after this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Honey Drippers was just like a super group. He got a bunch of friends together to do old timey stuff. Sea of Love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the guitar solo on this is amazing. Um, Rob Blunt just gets this. Incredible Stratocaster tone. Stratocaster is the kind of get the brand, the model of guitar he was playing. Yeah, um, and it's if you know guitars, there's it can be nothing else on this on this whole album. It's a, it is Stratocaster the album, um, and it happens to be my favorite guitar, my favorite electric. So that's part of it as well. Um, although it's probably my favorite electric because of this album. Um, I just love that solo and the, the tone, the note choice, everything. And how it kind of subtly, the guitar kind of subtly comes into the last verse, too. Because there's no guitar until that solo. It's all synth and right. bass and a little bit of percussion. 
That's what I was like, is this a prog song? What is this? Like, it, I had to go back and listen to this like an extra time just to see like, what is it that I'm listening to here? And when you have to do that with the ballad on an 80s album. Yeah, that's That saying something. On to track six, Horizontal Departure. Love his titles. <laughs> oh, his lyrics are meh, but I love his titles. Um, love the opening riff. Another one that's very syncopated. Um, and I love how the bass just kind of punctuates the, the verses. It just kind of comes in. And it's a very sparse part, but it just kind of hits you here and there. I think they've this is one where they've taken like the most chances on it, you know, musically mm-hmm. and vocally, like he's doing different things with his voice here mm-hmm. that, that, that actually still fit his voice. Yeah. But yeah, lyrically, yikes. <laughs> I do like the line. You said you'd cry a river. I thought you meant you'd cry a river of tears. <laughs> it's just a bizarre line. It's the only lyric I've quoted. Cause again, Plain's lyrics, not that great, but <laughs> But I love how the groove builds in the verses until we get to this big chorus. Um, great drum fills, uh, great groove in the chorus. Um, and I love the guitar stabs during the bridge. And how it, it almost has another bridge at the end. There's another whole section of the song for just the last few seconds. It doesn't just go out like on a chorus. Right. Uh on to track seven, Stranger Here Than Over There. Um, another one that's very proggy. Yeah, I mean, the beginning's very straightforward, but I, I, I like, you know... But it's a great half. call and response between Martinez and Collins. Yeah. Because Martinez plays a part, and then Collins just answers him. Oh, no, this is Bar- no, Barlow, this not is, Collins. Uh, yeah, this is... This is the one, you, it, it's not as obvious. Right. Um... Love the sort of angular groove in the verse. It's, you know, it's kind of similar to Reckless Love in that way. It's not just a straight groove. It's kind of off. Um, Probably my favorite bass part on the album. And for this album, that's really saying something. Um, Martinez, or Barlow is great in the verses. Um, Love the guitar and keyboard sounds in the bridge. Probably the proggiest song on the record. Although Maybe. I think Reckless Love... Yeah. Um, and he's got these great space guitar and keys on the outro. Um, and at the end, push, push. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're just going, again, going off with these solos and with these bizarre sounds. And then Plant's just doing his, his cliche thing and he's just very noticeably says, push, push. <laughs> And finally, my absolute favorite, one of my absolute favorite songs of all time, Big Log, number eight. I have been trying to sound like Blunt on this song for 35 years. Hmm. I wonder how this would sound, though, with like a bigger guitar player on it, though. Now, the guitar is perfect. He does this mix of like blues and Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, I see... Yeah, I see where he was going, but I'm kind of like, you know, if he'd gotten, like, Gilmore or someone to play on it, like, I wonder how that would sound. Other points on the record, I can, I can, you know, play with that thought experiment, but, but Blunt's perf playing on this song is perfect to me. You know, I can't imagine anyone else playing this song. Um, the riff is just perfect. That, that, and I, I hesitate to say it's a riff, because it's almost a solo. Right. The part right. that he plays between the beginning and in between the verses. Um, and I get he's doing the blues, you know. You know I get what he's going for here. Um, it's probably Plant's best vocal. Um, because he doesn't do his cliches again. That's true. He doesn't do his cliches. Um, it's re- I like it also that it's really sparse and subtle. Although Collins had to be bored out of his mind. Yeah. Because it's a kick yeah, drum even... and claps. Right, because I'm kind of not sure what they were... <laughs> like, Like it seems like they, they're underused here, you know? I mean... And the bass it... is kind of muddled again. You don't really notice it. The rest of the band, you don't really hear. For me, this song is all about Robbie Blunt. It's all about the lead who... guitar. 
I don't know if subtleties were what they really needed in this. I mean, yeah, and if they hadn't been subtle, I think the inch the the first track would have made more sense if they'd end it with like a rock song, you know. But I think he could have searched for different ways to have made a rock song rather than a Led Zeppelin rock song. Uh-huh. It, the, I, it's hard for me to, to criticize. Like that riff is practically part of my DNA at this point. <laughs> um, my it, it's it's almost perfect to me. I just would have liked a little more bass. That's really only my only criticism of this song. So I think other arms would be my weakest. Uh... Uh, yeah, that's my probably second weakest after in the mood. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's one of my Desert Island discs. Of course, I recommend it. Oh, I've been on the fence because it's like there's parts I like. There's parts that I think it's just a little too mellow. <laughs> mm. um, ah, I think it's kind of if you were if you're if you've heard most of the 80s stuff and you haven't like gone to this yeah i would definitely take a look at it It, and it's a good example of Prague in the early 80s too Mm. some of the uh a good half of the album at least Mm. so yes i'll recommend it all right that's it for the principal moments by robert plant until next time when we'll be reviewing a zonkey by umphreys mcgee (laughs) this is um this is kind of a transitional album for us, for, in terms of reviewing, because we did the kind of 80s prog, the early 80s prog thing, New Wave prog, and it's hard to find something that can transition out of this. Yeah. Like, this this one and, and Power Windows really mesh. It's kind of hard to find something to go to next, so I picked the mashup album. Because it's basically Umphreys McGee playing mashups. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's... I think I first started just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's the weird what the fuck that we're throwing in as a transition before we take, you know, another turn. Should be interesting. I've only skimmed it. Yeah, it's been a while since I've listened to it. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.